the time as they re-encounter the virus and then they're reactivated to produce more antibodies right away, just like artillery firing basically these antibodies into your bloodstream and into your airway spaces to protect you. And they're still there today for those people in the past still have antibodies against SARS-CoV-1, these B cells. In fact, people that had influenza in 1918 were tested 80 years later and they still had B cells producing antibodies against the original 1918 strain. So natural immunity is lasting immunity. It's against all of the proteins in the virus, not just one like you have with the vaccine. And it's the right kind of antibodies, IgM and IgA antibodies in your lungs and airway spaces. So when someone says, I'm not sure about natural immunity, I've shown you the data that even in people two and a half years after, they still have antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 in their bloodstream. And there's even antibodies producing cells, producing antibodies against SARS-CoV-1, probably because they're so similar that those B cells that those people had protected them by producing now antibodies that recognize SARS-CoV-2, even though they're for SARS-CoV-1. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, so this is a complicated slide. The important thing here is these are all the mutations that have been identified in all of the variants of concern since the original Wuhan strain from China. And when we look in yellow here, these are all the different variants. These are the Omicron variants here, but then we have alpha, beta, gamma, through here, where there is mutations occur. And what I've done is in green is where those mutations, there's no antibody response to that part of the virus in any of the people that we've tested with SARS-CoV-2. Let me explain that a little bit clearer. For most of the places where the mutations are occurring in these viruses, these variants of concern, these are not the parts that your immune system is recognizing. Only in a few little cases here, these, uh, these are probably the, the strongest where in Omicron. So when you look at the structure of the Omicron variants versus the original Wuhan variants, they're 97% identical in structure. The amino acid sequence, uh, there's about 1,271 amino acids, like a long beaded string. Well, out of those 1,271 amino acids, less than 3% of them are different. That means that when you have an immune response against Wuhan, it works just as good against the Omicron variant. This is the reason why when you are vaccinated with the original Wuhan strain spike protein, you still get an immune response that gives you some protection against an Omicron infection. Because it's 97% the same, but on top of that, what we see, and here is taking all of the spike protein here, this is a nucleocapsid protein, and here is the membrane protein, but the areas shown in yellow here are the areas where the mutations are occurring in the variants, any of the variants. And there's only one or two places where we see, in fact, where the mutations are occurring. So there, this bivalent vaccine that people are getting now, it's really, in fact, in the clinical studies where this was done, they get better results if they just use the Wuhan than if they use the bivalent. Okay. So uh, let's see how we're doing for time. Okay. So. We have six vaccines that are approved in Canada. Four of them are genetic vaccines and two of them are non-genetic vaccines. Two of them are RNA vaccines and two of them are adenovirus vaccines. These vaccines, the genetic vaccines work completely different from any other vaccine that's currently used in people. Okay? This is brand new technology. There's only one case of where a similar vaccine has been developed for people, and it's for Ebola. In fact, it's never been tested in people. 
because in the animal studies, what they know is 50% of the animals die when they get infected with Ebola. So no one is gonna do a clinical trial where there's a 50% chance that the participant is actually going to die from e Ebola. They can give the vaccine to people, and from a sa safety standpoint, they can know that uh, what the um, harmful effects may be, but it's a relatively small number of people in those studies. But in terms of actually testing its efficacy, it's never been done. Okay, so what's different about these vaccines? In a nutshell, the lipid nanoparticle is like a little soap bubble that's very, very tiny, you know, about a, a thousand times smaller than a, a bacteria or even a virus, okay? And it's got inside of it the genetic information, the RNA, to instruct the cells of your body that take in that lipid nanoparticle to make the spike protein inside the cell. And then that spike protein moves to the surface of the cell where it's anchored. So your own body cells are presenting this foreign protein. So what does the immune system do? It attacks it. And it kills or highly damages the cell, in this case like muscle cells, right? So then what happens is you have a situation where the muscle cells are actually being destroyed. And it's important to understand most cells of your body can, can be replaced. The, you know, you can get new skin cells, new hair cells. Um, you know, your gastrointestinal tract is continually turning over with those cells. But not your muscle cells that are skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle, and not your neurons. If those cells are damaged or destroyed, they're replaced by scar tissue. They're not replaced by new neurons or new muscle cells. Now that's really relevant when we're talking about the heart, which we can, we can talk about a bit later. So you have this situation, then your, your immune system, and especially if you have some antibodies already, those antibodies are gonna to stick to your own cells, to basically instruct the innate immune system with macrophages and neutrophils and all the like, to attack and destroy that cell. And in doing so, you get the cell into little pieces, we call these exosomes, that now are small enough that those neutrophils and other phagocytic cells can eat it and digest the spike protein to little pieces. And then those immune cells go to your lymph nodes and that's where they encounter the T cells and the B cells and educate those cells if any of those cells have a high affinity for that particular portion of the, um, the virus, then they'll grow and divide and make a clonal army of basically these immune cells that recognize that specific part of the virus. And that's how you educate your immune system. Okay, so, so you're fooling your own immune system that your own body cells are foreign. Now, why is that problematic? Well, as I explained, you're, you may be in fact damaging those cells, and there's a big problem here, because the lipid nanoparticles, when they're injected into your arm, they don't stay there. 76% of it, based on the Pfizer preclinical animal studies, and we don't have the data for people, 76% of it's gone in two days, and it's elsewhere in your body. And the organs that are the most likely to accumulate that is the liver, the spleen, the adrenals, the ovaries. And we now know it crosses the blood-brain barrier too. So it's going into the brain. The pituitary is one of the locations. So what's the ramifications of that? Well, then this is, could account for, you might be surprised to learn that about 40% of fertile women that are vaccinated have menstrual issues. 40%. Abnormal bleeding, either heavy bleeding or uh, prolonged bleeding, including in menopausal women get bleeding. Now, that's controlled by your pituitary and your ovaries. So if the ovaries are one of the major sites of accumulation of the vaccine lipid nanoparticles, 
and you produce the spike protein on the surface of the cells, then you get an inflammation and an immune attack against that. And you know, for a woman, uh, a young baby girl that's born, all of the oocytes that she's going to have in her life are already there. And once you, you reach the age that you can actually have periods, you have about 400 periods in your lifetime. That's 400 opportunities potentially to have a child. And when that's gone, when you run out of oocytes, that's when you go into menopause. So if you're, you're damaging the ovaries, even of these young babies, then you can expect that they will be less fertile later. Now, you know, that's hypothetical. But I can tell you this, for males, and looking at sperm counts, we know that there's about a 15 to 20% drop in sperm counts in males after vaccination. It recovers in about three to four months, but that clearly shows you that you can have an inflammatory attack against gonads that in the case of the females, you, don't, you, you can't replace those oocytes. In the case of the males, you can replace the, the sperms, spermatozoa. Okay. So, um, I was going to explain efficacy. So, we've all heard 95% efficacy from these vaccines. So, what does that mean to you? What do you think? means that you, you reduce your chances of getting COVID by, you know, 20 fold. I mean, put up your hand if you think that's what that means. Good. That's the impression I'm sure that most people have. 95% equity means that, you know, I'm 95% protected against getting COVID-19, at least for the six month period of the, the study. No, that's not what it means. That's what we, what we call relative risk reduction. That means that for, if you look at, at the people who actually get COVID that are unvaccinated versus the people that get COVID that are vaccinated, there might be initially a 95% difference. But if your chances of getting COVID during that six months is so low to begin with that it's symptomatic, then actually the efficacy is called absolute risk reduction and it's 0.84% according to the Pfizer trial. You read, so let me put this into a different perspective. Imagine you had a large population like Canada and you vaccinated everybody in Canada. You could expect to reduce the case numbers of COVID-19 by less than 1%. That's what our whole program is, is really designed to do, to vaccinate everybody, to reduce the incidence of COVID-19 by less than 1%. Okay. Okay, so I've already covered that. And um, I've already covered this. Again, reminding you that when you get COVID, even if you've been vaccinated, you can still transmit it. You can still get sick. And um, presently about over 85%, well, over 87% of the, of the population in British Columbia is vaccinated, at least uh, twice. The acceptance of the third shot has been much less. And I suspect uh, the vaccination of the young babies is even lower. So a consequence of this is that um, there's a very, very strong campaign. You've seen billboards, you've seen advertising to actually get vaccinated again, get your third shot, get your six month old babies vaccinated. and. Uh, you know, that's a whole big question. What, what is going on here? The data is showing the harms. Now, you might be aware that in Norway and Sweden and Denmark and United Kingdom and Germany, they are no longer recommending vaccination of people under 12, sometimes under 18, and in Denmark, not under 50 years of age, okay? These, they have their own health agencies that are reviewing the data and coming to these conclusions. So while we are approving the vaccination of babies that are six months old, 
at the same time we're we're going ahead uh, and doing this program here and, and giving people their their third shot or fourth shot if they're in nursing homes um, they're not recommending this in other countries and one of the reasons why is that you're getting temporary you may get a temporary reduction in your risk of getting COVID-19 when you have these vaccines but it's not quite as simple as this because when you take a look at people that are in nursing homes this is Quebec data here and you look at the total number of cases this is January of 2022 and here we're, we're around June and in the blue here this corresponds to people that are actually um, triple vaccinated and this is this is um, the number of hospitalizations being shown in this chart. The ones that are unvaccinated are the red here, and the ones that have two doses are in the, um, the gold color. Now, of course, because you have more people that are vaccinated, that means that you're going to have a higher chance of seeing people that will go to hospital, because as we know, if you are vaccinated, you can still get COVID and you can still transmit it. But you can see that there's a much higher numbers, clearly, in the people that are triple vaccinated, they're ending up in the hospital, okay? And when you adjust per capita, the difference is actually not that great between an unvaccinated person and a vaccinated person. For, in fact, the data that I've seen from the UK shows that you're three times more likely to get COVID if you've been triple vaccinated three times more likely. Now, how is this possible? Like, what's going on here? We can see that those people that, that end up in the hospital, these long-term um, care residents, this is again uh, Quebec data, they have much higher symptoms, whether it's in the case of any, any symptom, fever, malaise, GI symptoms, tachycardia, heart problems, desaturation, respiratory diseases, the list goes on. If you've previously been infected with COVID-19, you are more likely when you're triple vaccinated to have these symptoms. If you're not, if you haven't had COVID before, then you're less likely to have these symptoms when you're triple vaccinated. And the reason is simple. When you're vax, when you have COVID-19, you already have antibodies. It's almost like you've been vaccinated, right? In fact, it's like a double dose of vaccine. So the people that are getting their triple dose here of the vaccine, it's like really like five times exposure to the virus. So they develop, they're already, their immune systems are so, so used to actually having these reoccurring infections. And remember, with the vaccine, you're producing the protein on your own cells? Well, what is the, your immune system supposed to think? It, 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 it's, it has protection so you don't make antibodies against yourself. So when you have repeated vaccinations, you actually down-regulate and kill the B cells and the T cells that are most likely to provide you with protection against the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which has the spike protein on the surface, which is the antibodies that you really want to produce, those T cells and B cells that are going to give you the best protection are actually eliminated by this constant boosting. And especially if you've already got immunity, you're down-regulating your own immunity. So you can imagine the scenario that emerges from this. If you're constantly vaccinating your population and more and more people now are actually getting COVID-19 because they've down-regulated their immunity and the virus is continually to spread and to mutate, then you just, you just propagate the entire pandemic and it just keeps going because you've actually destroyed the natural immunity in your population. Okay, I'm gonna leave, stop here in this presentation. I'll talk more about other stuff later after seven, but here is an example from our own study where we have a, a, 
person who was vaccinated first, didn't have COVID before, then got COVID, because you know, we all can get COVID even if we've been vaccinated. He has actually a very nice immune response here um, against the nucleic caps, well, the membrane protein, so it's protective, and against these non-structural proteins in the virus. But the top half, this is the spike protein. So rows A, B, and C. So this person got vaccinated again, so they had COVID, then they got vaccinated a few months later, and then we tested them basically a little over a month after they've had their second vaccine shot, which only provides antibodies against the spike protein. So we look at this, and this person has hardly any immune response to the spike protein. What happened? They downregulated the spike protein producing T cells and B cells. They've actually reduced their natural immunity. So I'll take questions at this point so that, um, um, but I'll leave you with that, that lasting thought. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Thank you. Um, first question, what difference in immune systems are detectable between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated? Well, I think we've covered that a little bit, but the main difference will be that if you're vaccinated, you only have antibodies against the spike protein. Mm -hmm. If you have a natural immunity against all the different proteins in the virus, including the spike protein. Mm -hmm. And the natural immunity persists for years, but we know from this, the studies that have been done with the um, vaccines, you're lucky if you have efficacy for even six months. You have to get boosted again. So that's a big difference. And again, the kind of antibodies. The IgA and the IgM antibodies in your lung ways and airway spaces are very little of those are produced from vaccination, but are in large amounts from an infection. It's kind of like, my analogy is like, imagine a castle and you got all these guards in your castle, except at the front gate. So the perpetrator comes in, messes it up, and then leaves. That's the kind of protection that you get with vaccines. Second question. Is there a protocol you can recommend for someone who has taken the vaccine to detoxify and or flush it out from your immune system? Yeah, I wish there was um, a strategy that you could take. Uh, unfortunately, I can't myself envision a mechanism by which you can do that. The problem with the virus, the, the, sorry, the vaccine, is that when we were originally given this bill of goods, we were told that the RNA would be um, easily degraded. In fact, it was so unstable that we had to store it in minus 80 freezers before we got it to people, which I could never understand that the tests indicated that after about um, two hours at room temperature, a lot of the RNA was destroyed. But, but in fact, they added a component now that Moderna had, Tris, and it got stabilized all of a sudden. But RNA is very unstable in general in your body, and it will be, it should be completely degraded. The problem is, we now have studies that show us that the RNA can be converted to DNA. And the DNA can go to the nucleus of cells. So your chromosomes in your body, you have like 21,300 different genes. So the spike protein would be a, like one gene. And so that gene, when it's converted to DNA, it goes into the nucleus of cells and is stable, and then you can start making more copies of RNA from that DNA. And you can make, you know, forever, you can keep producing more RNA particles. From each RNA particle, uh, you can probably make, you know, 100 copies of the protein before the RNA is no longer stable and it gets degraded. But we don't know what the uptake is of the lipid nanoparticle from person to person into their cells the metabolic rate that's going on of those lipid nanoparticles so that that RNA is converted to protein can vary. We know that the protein itself can be detected months later, 
And that makes sense if, in fact, the RNA is stable. And that's suggesting to us that actually we may have a permanent change in the genetic background of a person to produce, it won't be transmissible to the next generation, but within that person, they may be continually producing spike protein. We can find spike protein RNA in mother's milk. We've found certainly antibodies against spike protein in milk. We're actually starting to find some evidence what seems to be spike protein itself in mother's milk. So it does look as though you're getting a permanent change. Now to detoxify that, I don't see how you can do it. I think what you want to avoid is getting vaccinated. Now I don't want to frighten everybody. Most people that are vaccinated, their body will heal, they will recover, you know, in time. But there's going to be a segment of the population maybe one in, in 250, one in 500, some estimates one in 1,000 I've heard, they will have permanent damages. There's nothing you can do about it. You know, if we talk about like myocarditis, that's permanent. There is no detoxifying. What you should do is just try to make sure you have a very healthy lifestyle going forward and minimize you know, the long-term risks. Next question, where does Bonnie Henry get her information? Well, she actually gets it from me because I've written her letters in the past that have explained this all to her and showed her where the scientific papers are. And so she, it's not she doesn't get the information. She is being advised by colleagues of mine at UBC and elsewhere. Um, a lot of it is top down coming from Health Canada. And the other problem with Health Canada is it's coming from the government. So it's actually not science. It, well, it's science, it's called political science. So, so, so yeah, so this is the problem. Uh, we, we, it, it defies logic to me from everything that I've read and the colleagues I've talked to, and I've tried to be pretty open-minded. I just do not understand where she's coming from. I mean, she was you know, well known early on in the pandemic about you know, be kind, be calm, you know, be safe. And frankly, you know, she's been the most draconian of all of the health, you know, public health officers in the provinces in Canada. She's, her actions really demonstrate panic to me in terms of the onerous conditions that she's applied. And unfortunately, as you can tell from my lecture, I believe that the policies that have been applied have actually been harmful. So... Let me dig into the culture of UBC. Mm -hmm. um, you're in the School of Medicine? Yeah, Faculty of Medicine, Department of Medicine. So you train do doctors? Yes. You train nurses? No, I don't train nurses. It's you the train medical doctors. students. Okay. Yeah. Since COVID started, has there been an increase in doctoral output? No. Um, the, the medical school at UBC has expanded over the years. There hasn't been a major expansion, though, for over a decade. Um, we do have an issue that we don't have enough family doctors. That's, see, when you go into medical school, you don't pick your specialty yet. It's at the end of it that you decide, well, I'm going to go for residency and more specialized training, and a lot of the doctors decide to do that. So we have a, a lower number of family doctors. But frankly, the family doctors, they're in a real difficult situation because when you look at the revenue that a family doctor earns with their own practice, you can get paid more as a nurse. Wow. So these doctors are working long hours, you know, 8 in the morning to 8 p.m., you know, with the billing schedules that the government has, and they have overheads, and so more of them go into clinics. And then in the clinics, you, you get less real attention because you don't get the same doctor. They're not really following you for a long period of time. So the quality of, of health care is actually seriously deteriorated. And the pandemic has made it even worse because we have more telemedicine now. So the doctor is not even touching 
the, uh, the patients anymore. And so we have a, an increase in all-cause mortality now, and it's coincident not with COVID-19, it's coincident with the introduction of the vaccines. Yeah. Okay, next question. With the um, emphasis on ho our hospital healthcare system being overwhelmed, mm -hmm. what has the government done to incentivize UBC to increase staff in our hospitals? <laughs> Oh, what can I say? I mean, the people that were the most likely to have natural immunity were the healthcare workers. And they saw what was going on with people coming to hospital with COVID and vaccine injury. And a lot of them, you know, have some basic immunology knowledge and science knowledge, and they don't want to get vaccinated. So I would say that there's going to be a, a segment that are going to be really zealots and they're going to say, we'll take the next vaccine that comes because they have a lot of faith in modern medicine. And then there's going to be a large segment. They're, they're, they're kind of reluctant, but, you know, they want to keep their jobs. You know, they've, they've worked so hard to get trained. They finally have a job that they feel that they're fulfilled at, that they're good at, they have experience at. And then they're told if they, they don't get vaccinated, you know, sayonara. You know, it's kind of like, you know, they were banging pots for these people a year before that they're real heroes and then, you know, come along and you don't get vaccinated, you know. So, so they let go. I think there's still around 2,500 healthcare workers. A lot of them are, are nurses, but a lot of doctors decide this was the time to retire. Some of the nurses, one of, one of uh, I guess, Kathy's nieces, she was trained and was a nurse here in BC. She moved to Alberta, where they don't have these policies. So, and then we have others that were outright fired. And so we, we're, I think we're short in terms of uh, nurses, about 4,500 nurses right now. But we let go so many of these people, and they still want to work, but you know the, the environment that's created, like Bonnie Henry's uh, I guess it was the, the September, the latest one, was it September 12th or something like that? She's basically saying that all healthcare workers, whether you're in a hospital or whether you're in a private practice or a clinic of your own, you know, you're a naturopath or, you know, a medical doctor or nurse, you must be vaccinated. A lot of these people don't want to do that. And... I've just explained to you the scientific data that's showing us what's going on, and they're aware of this too. So we're, we had a healthcare crisis before COVID-19. And what's happened now is exacerbated a bad situation that was already there. But when you actually look, for example, in data from Ontario, in terms of the number of ICU care beds, it never went over and above the historical norms. It's always about 10 to 15 percent lower than capacity at the peak times that we had COVID waves. So this idea that we've just overwhelmed the healthcare system, I mean, I think all, all of you may recall in the spring, what did we do? We emptied, we had 5,000 beds in the hospitals across BC. We emptied half of them so that we could take on this onslaught of people that were going to get COVID-19. We were actually coming out of the, the, the first wave by that point. So these hospitals for months basically were, I mean, there were dead zones. There was hardly anybody there. Nobody wanted to go to the hospital because they were afraid of getting COVID-19. And the care staff there, they were underwhelmed. A lot of the beds were empty. You know, the total number of people at the peak of COVID-19, when you look at the BC Center for Disease Control data, it was less than 350. You have 5,000 beds in the province. You emptied half of them. And the peak at any given time was 350. That shows you just how bad it was. We actually created the crisis from how it was handled. Yeah. yeah. What would you recommend 
for a young person who's unvaccinated going into the medical field right now? Yes, I've, I've had students approach me that have been accepted into medical school at UBC, but with Bonnie Henry's latest order, all students, staff, and faculty that are on hospital sites must be vaccinated. So my solution for her was to get her into our clinical study and provide her with that information that she could present and see if she could get a waiver because we could confirm that she actually had natural immunity and she was in a clinical study and you know, if there's anybody that should respect a clinical study, because you have to have controls, it should be a research, you know, university. So I'm hoping I think you're going to okay. see a rush in your <laughs> clinical study here real quick. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, next question is, um, what interactions do you have with fellow scientists at University of British Columbia? What is the, I guess the question is, the culture of dialogue at UBC? Was there public debate? Is there discussion? Are there forums uh, with fellow scientists? Is there uh, information sharing? Is that shared with the government? Is it shared with uh, Vancouver Coastal Health? Mm -hmm. What is the atmosphere in the, in the scientific community at UBC? Well, on Monday, we're going to have a, one of the ministers announce a major funding for UBC to promote the development of the RNA vaccines for future SARS-CoV-2 and other types of pandemics. So they're going to give major money. And the reason is that the lipid nanoparticles were developed, the technology at UBC, by Dr. Peter Collis's lab, which used to be right next door to my lab as a graduate student. And over the years, um, he's working like 40 years on what we call liposomes originally, and then we have lipid nanoparticles. And he was really working on these to deliver toxins to cancer cells, not for the vaccine technology. But the culture is that I'm connected with the Canadian COVID Care Alliance, but I'm also involved in other networks across Canada with more traditional thinking scientists. And presentations are given and we have a situation where there's a tremendous amount of grant funding that's available for COVID research. I'm afraid it's going to really handicap research in other diseases, but there's a huge bolus of money provided you're studying the right things. So for example, in our study, I applied to three different granting agencies. No one thought it was worthwhile to develop a serological test for SARS-CoV-2. This is the reason why first our company paid for it ourselves, and then later, because we couldn't afford it, we actually have to have our participants help in the study. So when presentations are given in these networks, like CanCOVID that I just mentioned, that's across Canada, in those groups, they're very selective in who they get to talk. And then when it comes time to teach the, med the, the doctors in BC, we have what's called continuing med medical education. So here what we'll do is we'll take certain key people in the university that are running vaccine programs, which some of them are consultants for Pfizer. In fact, you might be surprised. The BC Center for Disease Control, the, the major benefactor after the Vancouver Foundation is Pfizer. All right, so, so you've got these scientists that are being you know, treated, that are educating the medical doctors, that are consultants for Pfizer, that have major grants that depend on actually these vaccine programs unrolling, on, you know, like working smoothly. They are so conflicted. So a person like me that raises these things, you know, I'm in a tr tricky situation because I'm a senator at UBC in Senate. So I raise these things in Senate. And Nobody wants to hear it. It's like, you know, you're, because I've been around for a long time and I have a good reputation for my science, they'd rather just not encounter me. It's kind of like persona non grata. But I'm, as you can see, very vocal about this. And I feel 
working with the Canadian COVID Care Alliance with all these other scientists that are looking at the same data and they're, these are virologists, these are immunologists that are you know, award winning. They've come to the same conclusions. And, and even around the world, you know, we have like the Great Barrington Accord, even a year ago, you know, we had, there's, there's like over 50,000 people signed it, but there's tens of thousands of medical doctors that, that all agree that we should be using natural immunity to take on this pandemic rather than these vaccines. Mm -hmm. So I'm not alone. I'm just one of many, many people that have looked at this. And I can assure you that as time goes on, we're gonna look at this whole situation as one of the greatest scandals that ever occurred in the medical history. You know, we had, you know, Vox, we had, sorry, thalidomide, you know, we have Vioxx, you know, we had diethylstobestrol, and this is gonna be the one that takes the cake. Hmm. What is the atmosphere down the hall? Well, Do you have an office down the hall? Yes. Well, I've been off campus for about 10, well, 12 years now. Oh. So I go to the hospital to do my teaching, but my research lab is in my own company space. Mm. Yeah, and the dean of the university was not very happy about this, the recent dean, but all the previous deans were highly supportive. And so he really wanted me to come back to campus. Thank God <laughs> that I did not go back to campus because my research would have been completely shut down. Yeah, because mm. I wouldn't get vaccinated. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Okay, there's some okay we're going to take some here. questions from the floor. Uh, we have this lady here. Yeah, thanks for being so patient back there. Oh, no, you have a lot to give us. Um, I just wanted to backtrack a little bit mm -hmm. um, and, and just make sure that people understand when you were talking about the hospitals being underwhelmed, mm -hmm. there were a lot that were not underwhelmed. That's they true. were highly overwhelmed. That's true. And, 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 we, and what they did was they actually moved a lot of people to other hospitals, they like Kelowna. They cohorted. And then they sounded as though there were big outbreaks at those locations, but actually it wasn't as bad in those locations. So the thing is that you're talking to somebody who's a respiratory therapist and Good. whose daughter was elbows deep in a cohort hospital. Mm -hmm. I totally appreciate what you're saying here about mm -hmm. the, about the uh, vaccinations and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But what gets lost in all of these kind of conversations, whether it's locally or all over the interwebs, is um, people hear what they want to hear. Yes. And when you get a group of people who are anti-vax or pro-whatever, mm -hmm. they're only going to hear what they're going to want to hear. And yeah. it's important that you look at balance across the board. Absol absolutely. And, this and is yes, why they I did. They did cohort. Yeah. I had many conversations with people where I explained to them, no, you're not going to go to Langley and find anybody with COVID because they're going to be in Abbotsford, Surrey, mm -hmm. or uh, Royal Columbian, mm -hmm. where they were double bedding, where they were having, instead of one C ICU, they were taking over whole floors, and they were taking over the cardiac units and everything else just for the amount of people that were in those hospitals for COVID. They were COVID specialty. Mm -hmm. And it's important that I think you, as a voice that you have, do a disservice if you just glaze over that because people are hungry for anti-everything right now. Yeah. They're hungry no. for anti-medicine. They're yeah. anti-hungry, especially certain types of people, mm -hmm. hungry for anti-medicine. I. The amount of people I've heard who say they will never ever trust a doctor again for anything, I and know. it's because we glaze over and we only concentrate on one thing in a topic instead of looking at a broad spectrum. Mm -hmm. There were hospitals that were empty because nobody was going out, mm -hmm. people weren't driving, they weren't having car accidents, they weren't riding motorcycles and crashing into things, mm -hmm. um, nobody was going anywhere to catch anything from anybody else. But there were hospitals that were overwhelmed to the point, my daughter will never be the same for what she saw. Mm -hmm. And I don't appreciate that not being recognized when you make it sound like the hospitals were empty and it was all just a no, scam. No, that, that was that case at that time because by the time they did this emptying, we were actually already going into a dip. But your point's well taken. When you're in a peak, the peak then the that's where you have your greatest problem. But we emptied the hospitals at a time that was actually not. It was too late when we did that. Yeah. But the other thing, too, and your point is really well taken. I mean, 
when you, uh, I'm not against, first of all, I should preface that uh, I actually believe vaccination is actually really a very powerful way of controlling infectious diseases. Uh, I've been vaccinated against influenza. So uh, uh, my concern is really with the genetic vaccines because of what I know. And the thing is that for people that are in hospitals, it's, it's going to be very lumpy, right? It's going to depend on where you're at a peak or not. But I think there is a big mistake when we're letting people go that are, are not at greater risk of passing on COVID to a patient than a person who's vaccinated. And you're putting a huge strain on those individuals that are left behind in the healthcare system, which is now gonna subject them to stresses that will make them more likely to get sick. And actually we've seen this now in a number of professions. We're seeing that, that whether it's ferry workers or hospital workers, we're actually seeing now the people that are vaccinated are a greater injury. So if in fact what I've been saying transpires, if we are actually a greater risk of ill health for the people who are vaccinated, then this is actually going to create a much bigger problem for our healthcare system than what we had. Doctor, could you speak about presenteeism? Uh, in the sense of, of how many people are sick? No, for healthcare workers where, okay, I feel the pressure to go in, and this is Little mm -hmm. Mountain uh, Care Center where 49 residents died out of just under 100. Mm -hmm. And the care workers feel, you know what, they're already short staff. Everybody is already, as this lady rightly point out, they're mm -hmm. so burned out that I have to go in and I'm coughing all over the place. And I just got COVID and so I go to work. Yeah, well, the, the regulations in BC is that if you've had COVID and you're five days, you know, past the COVID, if you've been vaccinated, you can come back to work, even though you're not completely recovered from COVID. It's so five I, days, because there's such a, at these, these peaks, there's such a, 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 a um, insufficient number of people. Like our beds closed down, not because we didn't have the beds, because we didn't have the staff for those beds. So, so there's a clear recognition that we don't, we're short-staffed and we're getting the people that, like I say, are healthcare workers that have COVID, they can come back after five days. Mm -hmm. That's the regulations. So again, they're just as transmissible. Yep. Now the problem is when you look at some of the new medications that are out like Paxlovid, what we're seeing is that this is a very specific inhibitor of a, a protease, uh, an enzyme that's in the virus that's necessary to be active to allow the virus to enter inside cells. So you add this inhibitor and you can, of, the, of this enzyme, and you can get a, the, the virus can't get inside the cells as easily to replicate. However, people that are on that course, it's about $600. It, is about 10 to 15% of people that they do the full course, they feel okay, and then they come back. And the, the, it, it comes back, the COVID-19. They have to do another course. The problem with knowing how many people are actually sick in the hospitals from COVID, it's difficult because as I pointed out, about half the people that test positive by PCR actually went to the hospital not because of the COVID. However, the PCR test itself, it used at the cycle threshold, the 35 cycles or higher, is over 90% inaccurate. So if you've had COVID and you recover, and two weeks later you have the test, you will test positive for having COVID. So even those people going to hospitals will be test positive. So we just don't really know how many of the people that have gone to the hospital that have had COVID actually are there because of the COVID. 
the, the major cause of death of people in hospital is actually from pneumonia, from the COVID. So, and the, in, there's a lot of concerns about even how the treatment works when people are, are intubated. The, the force of the oxygen going in is so high that they can actually cause damage to the lungs as well, which makes it easier to then get a secondary infection like pneumonia. So there's all kinds of strategies that have been tried early on, and some of these were actually worse mm -hmm. than, they actually made it worse. And I'd say the, the most obvious thing to me was when we had these people in the nursing homes and extended care homes that got COVID, we didn't take them out. We actually left them, maybe we isolated them in a room, but it gets into the air system, it's an aerosol. And so we actually made these places killing zones, and that's why we had the highest rates of death mm -hmm. actually in the, so, so, so the healthcare workers may have gotten COVID and introduced it to the, 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 um, the residents, but the way we handled it after that mm -hmm. was actually inappropriate mm -hmm. for this kind of a virus. Yeah, we have some, um, there was one in Richmond where the guy had 400 and one or two outbreaks. The way he handled it was just great, but then we had Little Mountain that had almost 50% of the people die yeah. because staff brought it in. And um, so it's, it's tragic. Uh, we had another question. Please stand if you're gonna ask a question. The camera people are asking for you to stand, please. Yeah, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. They're sort of connected, but not. Mm -hmm. uh, are Peter Malone and, um, I'm sorry, Peter McClough and Malone doctors, are uh, they reliable and trustworthy? And the frontline mm -hmm. doctor's protocol for ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, are, they, are there enough studies to substantiate that they were right? Yeah, well, I mean, Dr. Malone is a, is a very good scientist. He's been in the business for a long time doing science. Uh, and he, in fact, what got him delisted from, from Facebook and that was he recommended the uh, video more harm than, than good that was produced by the Canadian COVID Care Alliance that I was involved in creating that video. So, but uh, everything that I've read from him is, is, is bang on. There's, there's nothing that I can see in there that, uh, for example, you'll see a lot of stuff about graphene oxide or snake venom, you know, in the vaccines and uh, that these are controlled by electromagnetic radiation that, you know, you, you can be um, manipulated somehow this way. This is all complete nonsense, right? So. He, he stays completely away from that. So I think he's credible myself. Um, uh, sorry, and your other point? The other one was on frontline doctors. Oh, frontline and, doctors, and their yeah. Their protocols Again, at the beginning of it all. That's right, early on they really pushed hydroxychloroquine. From what I understand with hydroxychloroquine, it does seem to work. So this is a, a malaria drug, basically, that's been around for a long time. It's pretty, it's pretty safe overall. Um, and a lot of clinical studies showed that it seemed to work. There was one clinical study where that they got an, a negative result, they claimed, and it was published in a peer-reviewed journal. And then subsequently it was found out that there was fraud in that paper. But it, because, you know, uh, President Trump was a strong advocate of this, it got tainted and nobody wanted to use it. But as far as I can tell, and Harvey Reich has done a lot of work on hydroxychloroquine in the United States, and uh, he swears by it, and he's again a very credible scientist. Now the ivermectin story is really, it's really interesting. The latest publication I've seen on this with a meta-analysis, because the problem is you have a lot of smaller studies and you're looking for you no know, double blinded studies where people don't know what whether they've gotten the treatment or not and the problem is that they've picked countries where ivermectin is is routinely used you can get it over the counter 
So you can't tell if a person's having some lasting effects of ivermectin to treat parasites in the water. Like, for six cents a day, you know, you can support a charity that allows children in Africa to drink the water. That's ivermectin that you're paying for, for those children. So they can safely drink the water. Ivermectin is a Nobel Prize winning, um, not the, the drug itself, but the people who discovered it. Yeah, That's right. And, and, and you know, there's been uh, probably about three to four billion doses given out of ivermectin. No one in Canada has, any, has died from ivermectin. It's routinely used. You can still get it for parasites. In fact, there's some very interesting cases of a hospital in Ontario where they had a parasite outbreak. And on that third floor, they gave everybody a higher dose of ivermectin. But on all the other floors, they gave much lower doses. None of the residents got COVID. Only the healthcare workers that came in to the hospital that weren't taking the ivermectin got COVID. But the latest study with Pierre, uh, Pierre Corey, uh, was one of the key authors on the puppy, there's over 88 separate clinical studies that show in aggregate a clear benefit from ivermectin given early on in the treatment. I don't advocate myself that you take ivermectin prophylactically. Uh, we have had a few participants that have done, they don't have any antibodies, which I guess endorses the ivermectin that it helps prevent infection. But you need to get exposed to this virus if you're healthy, when you're healthy, and you develop antibodies. And if you're starting to feel sick, then that's a good time to maybe consider some of these treatments. Um, not when it's too late, which is when some of those clinical studies were done with ivermectin that were negative, was the person was already sick and in a hospital and they tried to see if it's gonna be as effective. By then, the virus is not usually the big problem once they're in the hospital. The problem is the immune system is all screwed up and that's why dexamethasone works for a number of the patients that they actually get an improvement because they're actually reducing their immune function because the immune system with a cytokine storm, which is what happens by that point, these are cytokines are, are proteins produced by immune cells that trigger the activation of more immune cells. So it, gets, it, just, it just gets out of hand. So use at the right time, ivermectin and fluvoxamine. Now, fluvoxamine was, again, one of these that was controversial, but clinical studies have now shown that fluvoxamine works, and now that's actually prescribed in, in Canada. I think ivermectin, uh, it's, it's pretty safe. The, in fact, people should understand that Health Canada based their decision that they don't recommend ivermectin based on a study, it's, it's called the, um, oh geez. It's kind of, the key person is from McMaster University. The study was actually done in, in Brazil. Um, but they, there was a lot of problems in the protocol of that study, but they announced that they didn't see a beneficial effect in the study of ivermectin, and they just made the statement. And based on that, Health Canada uses that case to say that, well, we don't see that there's a beneficial effect. However, they never published the data for six months they never gave the, the actual uh, protocols that were followed. Once that was published, there was a huge number of organizations that could immediately recognize the deficiencies of that study. And they want that paper withdrawn because of those deficiencies. So Health Canada, like I sponsored a, a petition to uh, the parliament last year to not have vaccination of children. And there was another petition, which was not to use ivermectin. The response that came back from the health minister was that there was no clinical study that needs to be done that's double-blinded in Canada before they would approve its use, okay? However, they also stated 
that they would recommend that ivermectin is prescribed by a doctor because they want to make sure that people aren't getting overdosed with it because people are going to horse pastes with ivermectin, which, by the way, is just as pure as the regular stuff. But nonetheless, you know, a lot of people taking it themselves, they know the difference between a milligram and a milliliter. And, and what ends up happening is they can get very high doses. Um, so Health Canada recognizes that it's better that it's prescribed. But the problem is that it's, it's not illegal to prescribe ivermectin. I think people have to understand this. In Canada, it's not illegal. Any doctor can prescribe any off-the-shelf medicine for new applications, provided the doctor has reasonable belief that that medication can be beneficial for their patient. It's always been like this. However, what's happened is the College of Physicians and Surgeons in a number of the provinces, including BC, have taken it upon themselves that if any doctor prescribes ivermectin for treatment of COVID-19, they will be reprimanded and can lose their license. The same is true for any doctor that discourages a patient from getting vaccinated against COVID-19. They can lose their license. Why, so, why, why are they doing that? I, you know, th this is a, a whole different ball game. <laughs> We're going down the red pill, the blue pill, and you know, we can go there later, but not for this Say, question. Say, next question. I'm a political science student at UBC. What are some of the things the future government can do to ensure that such a thing would, ne would not happen again? Well, much greater transparency in the first place. Uh, I think a lot of the data that you've been seeing from the public health offices is, is actually highly manipulated to give you an impression that these vaccines are very safe and that they're also very efficacious. So a, a case, here's an example. If you, up to the summertime of this, this year, you would always hear that 99% of all the COVID cases in hospital are all unvaccinated people. That's, I'm sure you've heard that. But, but, but since the vaccines were available, well, for the first six months of the vaccine rollout, we had less than 10% of the population vaccinated, double vaccinated, and we had our two major waves of actually cases and deaths and hospitalizations. So everybody in that group is lumped in to the more recent data, and there was very few cases in the summertime of COVID-19. So then it, it kicked back in in September, and then we had a big peak again in December, January. But you know, you can, you can make that statement, but you're giving a false impression. What you really should be doing is saying, for the same number of people that were unvaccinated and vaccinated during the same time period, that's when you compare it. But telling people, 99% of the people in the hospital, that you know, were unvaccinated gives a false impression. Mm. And also taking the people in the first two weeks of vaccination, in fact, in BC, the first three weeks of vaccination, and that's when you're your greatest risk of getting COVID, getting vaccinated during that period, and taking all of those people and lumping them in with the unvaccinated, that's skewing the data too, and that's exactly what we did. Last question before we break for supper. What are some of the common side effects from the vaccine? The, 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 the common side effects of the vaccine are the same common side effects as getting COVID-19. Because as I explained, this is your immune system turning on that's giving you all these symptoms. The rare events, some of them are similar, and the one that I've heard most common is we know there's this high risk of myocarditis, and I can talk about that you know, in our next session. But you can get myocarditis from COVID-19. If you're infected, there is a risk. But the risk that I've seen from publications where they've actually quantified this now is 10 to 100-fold lower from COVID-19 than from the vaccine. Hmm. 
So there are, there are going to be long COVID, and we can talk about that. But it's very interesting, with long COVID, in the first year, the chances of getting long COVID was about 10% of COVID cases. And now the numbers seem to be closer to 40% of COVID cases, is what the numbers that are being battered around. After vaccination was available. So, I think that actually the vaccines are exacerbating long COVID. Mm, mm, wow. Okay, we're going to take a break. Uh, some of you might choose to um, uh, stay by for our main event at 7. You're more than welcome to do that. Right now, there's a free potato bar. It's open, and it's open till about 10 till. So thank you for coming, young adults. And uh, if you want to give Dr. Pellick a hand, thank you very much, thank you. Doctor. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. We'll look forward to more. Sure. Fantastic. There's more. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a break now. Just go down the hall and then eastward a bit, and you'll hit the potatoes. Thank you.